morning, and uh, congratulations to all of you. Uh, it's a great privilege to be able to welcome you here today. You've been selected from among your peers because of your dedication and commitment to excellence. I want to offer my personal welcome to each Army ROTC cadet and provide a very special welcome to our cadets from the United States Military Academy at West Point. We have an exciting week planned for you. Whether you're here as a cadet or cadre member, you'll be surrounded by some of our nation's best and brightest leaders. I encourage you, no matter your rank, to take advantage of the opportunity to share and learn from your teammates throughout the next three days. I also encourage you, if you've not already done so, to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at CG underscore Army ROTC. The Sergeant Major and I are in a competition to see who gets the most Instagram followers. So in this officer-centric command, you better not let me lose that competition. As myself and other senior uh, cadet command leaders seek to expand our social media presence, we value these tools to keep lines of communication open with you. And to see and to hear of your many accomplishments across our 274 ROTC programs and, of course, our teammates at West Point. One of the true highlights of my job is to participate in events like this where I have an opportunity to engage with you, future Army officers. Your presence here today signifies that you are not only committed to serving, you are committed to leading from the front with an eye towards excellence. While you're here, you'll have the chance to hear from and learn from several distinguished and accomplished leaders. They'll offer you perspectives on all manner of topics and I trust they'll make themselves accessible for dialogue outside their remarks. I encourage you to engage them, ask questions, and generate conversations which will enrich your teammates and our broader audience. Despite your access to these leaders, the most important takeaway from this week's symposium will be the peer-to-peer -peer sharing and interfacing with a multitude of leaders in thought and practice. The real takeaway should be how to interact with leaders and how even as a second lieutenant, you must seek to lead with confidence and wisdom. And you must learn where to find others to whom you can turn for guidance. And if you could implore, if I could implore you one thing to do as a result of your attendance at this week's events, it would be to think about how you will find your fox. Now, now, what exactly does find your fox mean? Well, first it starts with a history lesson. How many of you have ever heard of Major General Fox Connor? Where are my West Pointers at? No, a couple of them, a couple people? Okay. So if you've not had an opportunity to learn about Fox Connor on your own, perhaps you've seen me talk about him on social media platforms. I've referred to Major General Fox Connor in the past because for me, he is one of the most preeminent examples of mentorship and leadership in our Army's storied history. He wrote the book on how to develop leaders and soldiers of character and how to recognize potential and cultivate it into excellence and military professionalism. One of the most interesting points about Major General Connor is how very little was actually written about him. Sometimes we learn about our brilliant military leaders because they've left their work for posterity, perhaps even hoping it will be preserved for future leaders. Often, Generations that follow these leaders discover those documents, papers, notes, and use them as a foundation for their own success. But Major General Connor was different. He ordered all of his paper journals to be burned. Now why would someone who is widely regarded as the man who made Eisenhower, who was described by Eisenhower himself as the ablest man I ever knew, who was a serious soldier and technically proficient artillerist, and who was revered by some of our nation's greatest military giants, why would he order his writings burned? Well, before I answer that, I'd like to take a few minutes to fill you in on his backstory. Fox Connor was born in Calhoun County, Mississippi. His father was wounded in the Civil War and lost his eyesight during the last battle in which he fought. Even after losing his sight, the senior Connor went on to teach at a local academy alongside his wife. Education was important to them and that, along with his father's service, encouraged young Fox Connor to seek an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point. Now, it might surprise you to know, and perhaps some of our West Point teammates do, that Fox Connor was not a top cadet during his time at West Point. 
He did graduate 17th in his class, but unlike the West Point classes of the modern era, which pump out over 1,000 second lieutenants, his class had but 59 students. So he was solidly in the middle of the pack. Suffice it to say, such a class standing would likely not give him the opportunity to attend a conference like this today. More so than his academic achievement, what stood out in Connor was his determination. Once he was commissioned, his career took off. He earned a recommendation to serve on the Army General Staff, skipping the first year of the Army's two-year general service and staff college because of his proficiency in tactics. So acute was his mastery of the military arts that as a captain, he landed a teaching job where, interestingly enough, he taught colonels. His is a fascinating story, not just from a military perspective, but from the human perspective as well. Connor taught himself French, German, and Spanish, and found an opportunity to put those language skills to use as an interpreter for General Pershing during the First World War. It was here, through Pershing's mentorship, that Connor's brilliance was first recognized. Connor's own military career is a phenomenal study in strategic and tactical prowess, in the writing of doctrine, the advancement of multi-phased military planning, but the true trademark of his legacy was his ability to develop leaders. Connor was a powerful influence on many young leaders, among them Dwight D. Eisenhower. Connor's patient but steady focus with Eisenhower was instrumental in contributing to the skilled and accomplished leader that Eisenhower would become. He took a young Captain Eisenhower under his wing and encouraged him to read historical novels and books on military history, to think about ethics and the art of war. Then Connor orchestrated earnest, intense discussions about those books and those concepts. You see, Connor forced Eisenhower to think, to consider different views on the whys in history before remarking on the hows. Years later, Connor's mentorship of Eisenhower would be credited with instilling in the Supreme Commander the three maxims that would shape the Allied victory in World War II. Never fight unless you have to, never fight alone, and never fight for too long. Connor, who General Pershing called the most indispensable man in the American Expeditionary Forces, was also responsible for appointing Lieutenant Colonel George C. Marshall as part of Pershing's operation team. Fox Connor mentored Marshall, then placed him in a position to use his skills, his talents, and his intellect to better AEF operations, and in so doing, assured a place for Marshall in the inner circle of Pershing. Connor was keenly aware of the traits Pershing appreciated, and Pershing knew it was in the best interest to keep Fox Connor close because of his extraordinary ability to recognize talent and rapidly develop it. Connor enjoyed studying people, and he was a masterful and skilled listener. Sometimes it was the most innocuous conversations that led to the greatest outcomes, like a lengthy conversation on a cross-country train ride to Fort Riley, Kansas, when Connor, a captain at the time, met a young lieutenant named George Patton. This simple conversation between two men who were otherwise strangers led to a lifelong friendship. As a general officer, Connor learned the character of his subordinates by observing them firsthand. He believed in walking and interfacing with soldiers rather than relying on reports that were sent back to the division headquarters. A good leader appreciates the insight of others, but knows that there are times one must trust one's own discernment. Another key trait Fox Connor possessed was the willingness to associate himself with teachable junior officers from whom he could also learn. He knew that the most valuable relationships are those that enhance shared understanding for both parties. Each of us here, through our willingness to serve, have demonstrated that we are altruistic and selfless. Yet how much more inclined are we to exert additional energy, devote additional time, when our own needs are not also met? By studying young officers and recognizing the unique potential in a select few, Connor detected qualities in each of them that would aid his own development. There's a scripture I'm fond of that reads, 
As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Connor understood that by mentoring others. He could, he could continue to refine his own leadership attributes. Now, you've heard me mention George Marshall, George Patton, Dwight Eisenhower, all great leaders. I mention each of these soldiers because they shared a key attribute in their development as leaders. These senior officers, these military icons, were all influenced during a critical period of their development as leaders by the same man, a soldier who most history books have simply forgotten. Fox Connor found it more gratifying to inspire and motivate others to greatness than to achieve it for himself. His service to our nation lasted four decades. Even though his wife's family was wealthy and he could have certainly retired to enjoy the fruits of his labor much sooner, his commitment was unshakable. His devotion, unmatched. His dedication, unquestionable. So I take you back to my original question. Why would he order his writings burned? Well, I can't tell you definitively what his reasons were, but I would suggest based on what I know about this great leader, that Connor was more concerned in leaving behind a legacy of mentorship than leaving behind journals and documents. I believe the argument could be made that Fox Connor found it more important to leave landmarks than a roadmap. I would wager that Connor wanted future leaders to build upon the military successes of his generation by thinking critically about their own strategies and tactics. I think that while Marshall, Patton, and Eisenhower relied on his guidance and tutelage to progress as leaders, Fox Connor wanted leaders in my generation and yours to find our own Fox. So today I encourage you to begin to consider how you'll grow. Who will nurture your intellect, your specific talents, and your interests? I urge you to be available for that counsel, be open to guidance and course correction, and be eager for the work, the effort the extra hours it might require. Most importantly, I hope you will seize opportunities when presented. Starting today, commit yourself to find your fox. Enjoy this week's events. Congratulations on your selection as Marshall recipients, Leadership Excellence.